I think I got a senatorial arm. Uh, I'm getting a shoulder. Hello. Nice, you could stop off. And then serve and then he talks. You've been touring? We're going to have all the women and women under the veranda. The senator is going to talk to all of us first. Then we're going to eat, and then he's going to talk to everybody. Okay. So that, and, and, unless you want to be Unless you want to sign Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. we'll sign the work. <laughs> yeah, well, I would have to see you do that. I would have to see you do that. No. No, not a day. Probably right after I was telling you that you're probably about 170. I'm just saying, 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 as we all know. I don't have to mm -hmm. tell anybody. I kind of had an uh, interesting experience about an hour ago. Uh, we were driving up and we stopped at a place to get a cup of coffee and there was a guy in line there with me and he walked over to me and said, Senator McCain, hello, I'm, I'm a small businessman. Uh, and uh, I said, well, how are you doing? He said, terrible. Uh, and I said, well, w what seems to be this situation? And he said, well, you know, 
He said, I'm a small business person. I've had a line of credit from the Bank of America for the last seven years, and I was just told that I don't have any more credit, that I don't have another dime. He said, I have, nothing's changed. Still got my business, still have been paying, repaying uh, my loans. Uh, business is okay, but now I'm going to have to go out of business. Um, you know what's kind of interesting about that story that was just, and, and this was an older guy, uh, uh, still supporting his wife and family. And what was kind of interesting about that story is that we have given, with your tax dollars, the Bank of America, I don't know how many billions of dollars. And they've taken that money on the premise that they were going to keep those small business people in business. And they're not. And they're not. So what we did, we told, we told Chrysler, we told Ford, and we told these financial institutions and these banks and others that you're too big to fail, so we give them billions and billions. Well, I think Chrysler got $50 billion. I mean, excuse me, General Motors, $50 billion. Mm -hmm. You own a car company now, by the way, my friends. Yeah. You and the, and, the, and the United Auto Workers Union. And so... And they got Merrill uh, Lynch, too. Yeah, Merrill Lynch and all, all, of, the, all, all of these others. Uh, so, so we tell them that you're too big to fail, so we'll take the taxpayers' dollars and save them. But that small business guy, who's a generator of jobs in America, we're gonna look with, they're too small to save. I didn't mean to start out our conversation this way, but it's, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating with a $1.8 trillion debt we're going to run up this year, the largest in the history of this country by a factor of two, the largest deficit we've had uh, in any time outside of World War II was $450 billion, which was outrageous, and now we're going to have a deficit this year of $1.8 trillion, and yet we can't tell that small business guy, here's a line of credit. Not, not, not give him money, but here's a line of credit so that you can borrow money to, to, to stay in business. And how many homes, how many homes in a, in a, across Arizona today are people having to throw the keys on the floor and walk away from their home? It was a housing crisis that started, that started this, and this administration has not done anything to address the fundamental problem of the housing crisis in America. Mm -hmm. So I, co I come to you today at the, one of the most interesting times in American history where we're about to see an attempt to have an eventual government take over uh, the best and highest quality health care system in the world. And if you don't believe me, go to Canada, go to England, and ask about the health care systems there where health care is basically rationed and people wait months or even years, or because of age, uh, I'm really worried about you, uh, are ineligible for, are ineligible for uh, uh, any uh, kind of health care if they are afflicted with certain uh, challenges. So um, we're fighting a good fight. Elections have consequences. I thank you for your support in the last election. I was honored to be able to carry the state uh, of Arizona and the turnout and the support is one something I'll never forget. I'm running again. I'm running again, and I'm running because I think that I have the ability to try to help America through these difficult times. And <laughs> so I want to say to you, I do not take anything for granted. We are working hard. I'm traveling all over the state. I'm working with. Uh, with all of our, our, our members of the Republican Party. I was down in Yuma yesterday. It was a balmy 118 on the runway, Marine Corps Air Station, and, uh, and traveling all over the state as I have been since I lost. By the way, everybody comes up and says, I voted for you, I voted for you, I voted for you. I'm going to demand a recount. <laughs> so but, so uh, I'm very grateful for your support. I am not taking anything for granted. I'm working hard, and I will continue to work hard to, to gain and, and keep your support in the upcoming election. I'd like to point out to you that the Democrats did very well in the last election in Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico. When you look at the makeup of those states, you'll see they have Democrat governors uh, or a Republican governor in trouble, Democrat senators and Democrat representatives. The next state they've targeted is the state of Arizona. I was honored that the President of the United States came to ASU and spoke at graduation. 
but it, I'm sure that it was the reasons were not all together just because he loves the state of Arizona and he's coming back. The Democrats are going to pour a lot of money into the next campaign to try to win the governorship, to try to win the Senate seat, try to get the legislature, and try to knock off people like John Shattuck and, and other Republican members uh, of Congress. So we need your help. We need you to be engaged. I'm proud of Clark's leadership. Diana, thank you. I know who wins elections. Could I just mention you one quick story? Um, when I first ran for the United States Senate, uh, there's a woman that many of you know uh, from Chandler, Arizona. Um, uh, Marcella. Uh, uh, Marcella Peters. Marcella Peters has been active in the Republican Party for many years. She ran my campaign in Chandler. We won Chandler. I won the Senate seat. I've been in the Senate for about six months, and one night at 2 a.m., the phone rang. I answered the phone, and I said, what is it? She said, this is Marcella. And she said, I've got a terrific problem. I said, what is it? She said, they're changing the garbage pickup in front of my home from Tuesday morning to Thursday night. <laughs> she said, on Wednesday night, I have Chandler Republican Women's Club meeting. On Thursday morning, I'm down at Republican headquarters. Where she said, we went on for about 15 minutes talking about this problem they had with them changing the garbage pickup from her home from Tuesday morning to Thursday morning. Finally, I said, Marcel, why don't you call the mayor of Chandler and discuss this issue with him? She said, oh, no, I wouldn't want to bother an important man like that. <laughs> 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 Every once in a while, you do get your proper role put in the right perspective, as I'm, I'm sure you know. So I'm going to go back to Washington tomorrow. We have the defense authorization bill on the floor. The fight goes on on health care ref reform, and there are many other issues that, that I'm so proud. I am so proud to partner with John Kyle. Thank you for all the support you've given John Kyle. He's a Republican leader. And he's a national leader. And uh, frankly, the Obama administration is not very happy with him, as you may And let me just mention one other thing about health care reform, if I could. The push that the administration is going to make is to get this thing rammed through before we go into an August recess. Because they know that this proposal of theirs is like a fish in the sun. Okay? After not too long, it doesn't smell very good. And so they don't want it sitting out there over a congressional recess because it really is an, an incredible, an incredible proposal that will lead to the eventual takeover by the federal government of the healthcare system in America. And I know you don't keep up with everything day to day, but I would like to remind you that just day before yesterday, the Congressional Budget Office issued a report, which is devastating, which is devastating, said the proposal will not lead to any cost savings, mm -hmm. and that the path that we're on is unsustainable, mm -hmm. is unsustainable because of the mammoth deficits and the amount of money that it's costed. So uh, they don't want it sitting out there. And what they're going to try to do, we all know, is they're going to try to muscle two or three Republicans in to uh, supporting and, and, and ramming it through, and then really basically uh, writing whatever bill they want. Um, look, I respect the, the other point of view, but I heartily disagree mm -hmm. with a government takeover of the health care system. I heartily disagree in forcing small business people to, to have a government health uh, sponsored health insurance plan for their employees mm -hmm. or pay a $750 fine for each or one of those employees. Mm -hmm. The generator of jobs in America is small business. They're the ones that will suffer from a government, this plan that they're trying to ram through. And let me just, you know, it's easy to talk in general terms. Let me just tell you an example of the kind of attitude that prevails there. We had, we're in this, I'm a member of this committee now. I'm brand new. I went on it because of health care called the Health Committee, Health Education uh, and and, uh, labor and pensions. So the, they ran, they moved this bill through. There was an amendment by Senator Mikulski of Maryland that expanded women's health care in an incredible degree, eligibility, etc., etc. And I said, how much does this cost? She said, it's not 
the cost that matters, it's the cause. Oh. Oh. That, that, that was her response to the billions of dollars additional that it's going to cost the American people. So we're fighting a good fight. We will prevail, and I promise you we will prevail over time because America and the Republican Party is a right of center party. The president is governing from the far left. That does not jive with the American people's views and dreams and hopes and aspirations for their future. I've talked too long. I'd like to say thank you for your support. Thank you for supporting our party. I'd like to respond to any questions or comments or insults you might have. <laughs> but before I do, I just want to point out to you, we won in Iraq. Thanks to the brave young men and women right. in America. stay the course, if we stay the course in Afghanistan, if we increase the number of troops we have, it's going to be long and hard and tough. American casualties will go up, but we cannot afford to have Afghanistan be a base for Al-Qaeda to launch attacks against the United States and our allies. It's going to be tough, but if we stay the course, we will succeed and we will bring freedom and democracy throughout that part of the world. And by the way, I think that the beginning of the end of the tyrannical rule of Muslim extremist clerics in Iran is, is you saw on the streets of Tehran. And all of us, all of us should stand up for those brave young people who are literally risking their lives in the cause of a free election and democracy in their country. Thank you very much. question or comment before we, uh, before, yes. Well, if the housing market is, if the housing market's the root of the problem, what about a $15,000 tax credit for any new home buyer, not just, I mean, any home buyer, not just the new ones? It's a proposal we have supported for a long time, and we need that. And we also need for the government to go in and buy a mortgage of a person that cannot afford this arm, this dramatic increase in the cost of the mortgage, and give them a mortgage they can afford the payments on. Otherwise, uh, and I know that's a little controversial because people who are making the payments then don't get that same benefit, but you tell me what happens to the value of your home if the people mm -hmm. around you in your neighborhood leave it. And so, uh, yes, but $15,000 is very important, it should be across the board. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about North Korea? North Korea. It's a, it's a serious threat. They've got this bizarre guy running it. Uh, by the way, his, the, the deer leader, his father was the great leader. He's the deer leader. The deer leader has a son who lives in Macau who's a gambler. Has another son who, what, I, I'm not making this up, was caught entering Japan with a bad, pad, a bad invalid passport because he wanted to go to Disney World Japan. <laughs> and I mean, it, it's it, meanwhile people are star literally starving to death in North Korea, and they continue to build nuclear weapons. We haven't been tough enough on North Korea. The Chinese are the ones that really can affect North Korea, and they haven't been helping out. The Chinese can control the economy of North Korea. And we should make our relations with China dependent on their help in reining in North Korean nuclear uh, weapons. Now, they have nuclear weapons and they have missiles. They haven't been able to match them up yet. But it's a matter of time before they have a missile with a nuclear weapon that could strike Hawaii or Alaska or even, over time, the United States of America. It's an untenable situation. The sanctions that the UN just in invoked I'm glad to see it, but they aren't really impactful on North Korean behavior. Nemo, yes. First of all, I'd like to thank you for coming out to mm -hmm. speak to us. And during your speech, you said that you are asking us to help you. And I know that you do need the voter, but I'd also like you to know that we need you right now um, with the numbers that the Democrats have in Congress and the, the rapidity that they're introduce, introducing uh, dangerous legislation. We need a strong, united vote our voice against the Democrats and I want to commend you this past week for speaking out against the hate crimes legislation mm -hmm. and uh, deriding the uh, Democrats going around judicial due process or not judicial but a uh, legislative due process so I thank you for that but you mentioned Afghanistan and what makes you think that this time 
in history is different. Nobody's ever won in Afghanistan. Is this realistically something we can win? And do you see the danger of uh, these anti-terrorism laws that are going into place that are being used against the American people and the surveillance society that's um, spreading? And we've seen that in the last couple of weeks with articles that have come out saying that the surveillance program is much greater than uh, we had heard when Bush was in office. So, these are some concerns I have, and I want to know your response. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, you, you covered a lot of ground, so I, I, I hope that, that I could respond to maybe the most important parts of, of your questions, and thank you. In Afghanistan, we should all study history. We should all study history, and we should study the history of Afghanistan, particularly the British, the Russian failure, etc. The British basically did control Afghanistan. They had suffered the greatest military defeat. I think it was 1847, and then they came back a couple years later, and they basically had control of them. Um, Afghanistan is a tough place, but the same strategy that worked in Iraq, adapted to the different conditions in Afghanistan, will succeed. General Petraeus is confident of that, and if General Petraeus is confident of it, I'm Confident. Of here, here. It. It's yeah. going to take more troops, and it's you've got to have this strategy where you go in and you hold these areas so you allow people to live normal lives. You've got to establish an environment of security for people so that the economic, social, political, and all the rest of it can can move forward. We are now moving into the southern part of Afghanistan, <clears throat> which is not only important because of the population, but that's where the the heroin comes from. That's where the poppies are grown, and that's what's been funding the narco traffickers and the corruption that exists terribly in the Afghan government. Um, so we can succeed there. They do have an elected government. It's a weak one, and it's got a lot of corruption, but we can succeed there. I could spend a long time telling you about that, but I believe that we can succeed. Now, on surveillance, there's got to be a better partnership between the leaders of Congress and the ad administration. And there may have been more surveillance than we thought there should be. But I think we have to remember the situation after 9-11. America had been ta attacked. A couple of thousand of our citizens had been killed. And there is always sometimes a little bit of an overreaction. But I want to talk to you for a second about this this. Uh, movement on the part of the Democrats to blame the Bush administration <laughs> on this thing about training teams to go kill Al-Qaeda leaders. Is there anybody here who doesn't want to kill Al-Qaeda leaders? <laughs> no, <laughs> really. Raise your hand if you don't want to kill Al-Qaeda leaders. Okay? I mean, really. And this plan never went into effect because we really didn't know how to implement it. Is there anybody that doesn't want to kill Osama bin Laden today? I do. Okay? And the fact is that what we're doing right now in Pakistan, dirty little secret, okay, with, with predators, is we're killing bad guys. Okay? We are killing them. Is there anybody who thinks we should stop doing that? No. We're killing the Taliban with, with, with great uh, uh, with intelligence and capability. So I worry always, and your concern is legitimate, that the government does not overreact and surveil uh, innocent citizens and we do everything we need to do everything we can to protect the constitutional rights of Americans. But there's always a tension between defending our nation's security and uh, preserving the rights of the of the citizens and that's got to be a careful balance. I would remind you that we incarcerated thousands of Japanese American citizens in World War II. We shouldn't have done it. In the Civil War Abraham Lincoln suspended the rights of habeas corpus uh, and other rights of the citizens of Kentucky and Maryland, and he shouldn't have done it. But we take the responsibility for it over time, and the great thing about America is we correct those abuses. So, yes, I worry your concern is legitimate, but our first priority is to preserve the national security of the United States of America. And I'm sorry for the long answer, but we hear from a small businessman. <laughs> My big thing is I have a trauma coordinator here at Flagstaff Medical Center, and we're this Flagstaff is a sanctuary city. 
so they allow illegal aliens to stay here hands off, and it costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars for a traumatic injury. Um, the new uh, Director of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, failed in her governorship in Arizona to control the borders. How can the federal government control the borders and health medical centers that are grounding to control these people? First of all, I, I certainly think that the sanctuary cities thing is a terrible mistake, and it's it, it's it's wrong, and we should we should eliminate uh, that. And the federal government does not have to be governed by some city declaring itself a sanctuary. No matter what they declare themselves, federal laws need to be enforced. I was in the border yesterday in Yuma, and the illegal um, immigration. Uh, human smuggling is way down thanks to the increased construction of fences, barriers, sensors, surveillance, <coughs> etc. And it's way down. The drug interdiction is way up. And the drug cartels are incredible in their imaginative ways of trying to get drugs into this country. They're now using ultralights in case you hadn't, in case you hadn't heard them. We're uncovering tunnels that are engineering very sophisticated engineered drug term tunnels. They're not just somebody digging a hole. They have wooden sidings, they have electricity, they have even tracks to move the drugs back and forth. And uh, we are beefing up the border and we are becoming more effective. My great worry right now is the ability of the Mexican government to maintain control of their country. <laughs> The drug cartels are, are threatening the very existence of the Mexican government. This, this president of Mexico is a good and great man. And he, the first president, has decided to take him on. Guess what? His popularity is declining. He just lost an election. His party did in, in off-year elections. And, uh, I mean, I'm sure you read about it. That they just, in his home state, they gathered up 12, uh, they got 12... Mexican policemen and killed them and stacked them up in, in a stack on the side of the road. They, they cut off people's heads and throw them into the, into the square. So we've got to do everything we can to help the Mexican corruption goes up to the highest level. This is a $16 billion a year business and what's a couple of million dollars? The tunnel I just uncovered was a million dollar project. But that's nothing to these drug cartel people. So I want to I want to stop the illegal immigration. And we've got to do everything we can to secure our borders. And but securing our borders also means helping the government of Mexico stop this threat to their existence. Some months ago, I was in Mexico City. The second ranking guy in the anti-drug uh, bureaucracy in Mexico lived anonymously in Mexico City in an apartment. He went home a different way every night. He had security guards with him, etc. He came home one night. There was a guy waiting for him in his apartment. Shot him in the head eight times and killed him. The guy who did it had the keys to his apartment. I mean, that's how high. And there are people who are in our embassy, American employees in Mexico City, who have been arrested. There are border and customs people that have been corrupted on our side of the border. So it's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. We've got to get it under control. And sealing, securing the borders is the key to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Senator, yes. thank you for being here. And I'm for a recount. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's fair. Thank you. Well, yeah. could I end up, because I know we all want to eat, could I end up by just saying, well, to, uh, I'll give two but short answers. I have answers. a question. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, on defense, which uh, I commend you for mm -hmm. your position and your leadership. Today's Wall Street Journal. Um, had an article by John Lehman, yeah. uh, former Secretary yeah. of the Navy, uh, and he points out that wasteful defense spending, something that you've been uh, very critical of, um, is really a threat to our national security. And he points out a fact that I thought was astounding. The Skyhawk <laughs> that you flew cost about $860,000, right? right? 67. Today, uh, Counting into inflation on an inflation-adjusted basis, that plane cost about 18 million. We're paying 90, 90, 90 million dollars for that plane. 
Now, he gives a very compelling argument about the dismal accountability at the Pentagon, uh, <laughs> the dismal, um, you know, military folks going into the contracting uh, business and with the defense contractors. Um, what does Congress have to do? I know you've read this, and thank you for that. But uh, Thank you, Rosa. Thank yeah. you. Just let me say there's corruption. There's corruption. We have former members of Congress, Republican and Democrat, residing in federal prison. The earmarking in Port Fairly is corruption. It's not, I, I can't paint it any other way. This guy, Murtha, uh, the congressman from Pennsylvania in the House of Representatives, uh, has been investigated. His former chief of staff is under indictment, and there's going to be more to come. Uh, the, the, the Secretary of Defense is a fine and good man. As you know, he was appointee of President Bush. And uh, the, air, the big fight we're going to take up on Monday is whether we continue production of the F-22, which has a thousand subcontractors, which has never flown over Iraq or Afghanistan, never flown, whether we're going to stop production of that and continue production of the Joint Strike Fighter, which by the way will be coming to Marine Corps Air Station Yuma and Luke Air Force Base, uh, and, and which, can, which is much better in the long run for defense of this country. The difference between the Joint Strike Fighter and the F-22 is the F-22, the uh, Joint Strike Fighter is not in full production, so therefore it doesn't have all these subcontractors. So it's going to be a big fight, and um, we need to win it. We need to win it to stop this waste in defense spending, uh, which has become corrupt, as I said. Real quick. Okay, I do own some manufacturing company and copy on restaurants. And we had the downsides when Vice went and went to the effect of the whole industry. Our cash flow value goes up. Actually, hiring is pretty good. We didn't go, but we're working our way out of it. But we had to do it without health insurance. My wife and I cannot get it established. We've been fighting for months. And because we're individual people, we don't, we're not part of the group, and we haven't been able to do that. The other thing, can you, have you considered Medicare expansion to cover the whole? American uh, population. Being it is a well established system, it doesn't take a lot of. But it's going to be bankrupt for most of the seven years. Well, uh, we will be bankrupt already. Uh, let, let me just say uh, first of all, our proposal was to give every American family a $5,000 refundable tax credit, or as, if necessary, as high as $7,000 so they can go across state lines to get the health insurance that best suits them and their family. I can prove to you that with that kind of competition across state lines, you can get a pretty good health insurance policy. Now, you can't get it in New York City, where it's the average is something like 17000 but you might be able to get it from Utah, where the average cost is about 4000 So, they are, right now, the employer-provided health benefits are not taxed, okay? And that is resisted reform of that because the unions have the most expensive gold-plated uh, health insurance benefits that were negotiated by them with management. So all I can tell you is that we need to reform health care in America. But a larger and larger uh, government involvement is higher and higher costs. The original estimates that Medicare was going to cost $90 billion a year. Now it costs several trillion dollars a year, and the inflation is double digit. So I want to reform health care. I want to make it affordable and available for your family, but I don't believe that Medicare expansion will do that. Yes, sir. Senator McCain, senior a Republican neighbor in the state of Nevada, um, and with no uh, disrespect to Senator Anderson, who would you think would be the, the most likely candidate to get, uh, run against Senator Reid in 2010? The Congressman uh, um, um, I've, I've talked to him three times. Congressman from Nevada. Mark, where's where's my guys? Republican Congressman from Nevada. Yeah, Steve Heller. Steve Helen? Heller. Dean Heller. Van Heller. Van Heller. Oh, Dean Heller. Dean Heller. Dean Heller. Dean Heller. I think he would be the best candidate. We've got to convince him to run. And if he runs, then I want to assure you 
that unless I'm otherwise occupied here in Arizona, I would be traveling a lot. I promise. I promise. By the way, I'm sure you know that Senator Reid's rate, approval ratings are very low. Yes, they are 31%. But I, but I, but I, but I stop and maybe talk to each one of you individually. We're all, we're all hungry. <laughs> but I finally uh, tell you, it's hard trying to do the Lord's work in the city of Satan. <laughs>